Welcome to the newest episode of the Giants Huddle Podcast. Joined by Paul Dottino, today's guest, Mike North. He's the vice president of broadcasting for the National Football League. We're going to talk about the NFL schedule. Thank you for being with us. Just a reminder, you can find the Giants Huddle Podcast on Giants.com slash podcast on the Giants mobile app and on your favorite podcast platforms. Mike, thank you so much for being with us. We appreciate it. And boy, uh, I'm sure it was a process. I see sunlight behind you. So you've been let out of the dungeon now that the work is done. Congratulations. Welcome back to the world of the living, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm Punxsutawney Phil, man. They take me out uh, once a year. They show me around. They let me uh, talk to some people, shake some hands, kiss some babies, and then they put me back in the hole till next spring. Well, let's start here. Let's get very basic with it. When did this process start? The scheduling process starts the day after the regular season ends. That's when we know the final matchups. You know, we're mostly rotation-based for who plays whom, but there's a couple of standings-based games, or at least there used to be. Now there's three with the 17th game. So uh, as soon as we know all the matchups, we get started. Obviously, there's still a lot of storylines to finish up, who wins the Super Bowl, uh, rematch the championship games. We follow the offseason like all the other fans. Where are the free agents going to go? What's going to happen in the draft? Uh, but we start, you know, the day after the regular season ends, and we'll use every minute of every day that the commissioner will give us. Uh, if he gave us another month, I'm sure we'd find another schedule or two or ten. I'm not sure they'd be that much better than what we're holding in our hand. They'd be different. Um, but we would uh, use every minute they give us. It's all day, every day, 24-7, uh, from the day the regular season ends until the day the schedule gets released. Mike, to have the schedule released in May this year, was that a matter of circumstances because of the way things worked out with the pandemic and all those other things that had to be logistically changed? Or was this a plan all along? And how do you plan to do it going forward? This is something we've been talking about for a couple of years. You guys know I haven't done this for a long time. Schedule used to come out like second or third week in April. And it just kind of got dropped on you. You know, we didn't know we were done until we were done. And then as soon as the commissioner said, yep, that one's good, let's go, uh, you all had 24, maybe 48 hours to get everybody back and get together and get your ticket pricing right and get your social media channels ready. And it just kind of dropped in the middle of April when everybody was mostly focused on the draft. So now we can take all of April, really focus on the draft, really meet these kids, meet these prospects, do everybody's mock drafts. And then the draft happens, everybody gets their, you know, post-mortem, everybody gets their draft grade, and now we know where everybody's playing, and now we can get ready to find out when they're playing. So this is the new normal. Schedule's going to come out first or second week in May. Gives us a week or two to react to something in the draft. You know, I don't think it was a big surprise that Trevor Lawrence went to the Jags, but if something big had happened, i.e. a certain quarterback in green and gold out in Wisconsin had changed teams, you know, that's something we would have wanted to react to and obviously if the schedule was out in mid-april we couldn't now that it's going to come out in may we'll at least have that window where if something earth shattering happens we can adjust i know we already have mock draft season here comes mock schedule season mike you're gonna have to start having some fake schedules come out that are going to try to predict these things now you ready for that everybody's an expert nobody knows anything every time you see a mock schedule or a supposed leak schedule before you know a day or two out uh it's false because literally the schedule was not done we didn't get the commissioner's blessing until monday the 10th at about noon so anything prior to that was just conjecture was just speculation um you know once we gave the schedule to the teams on tuesday gave it to the television partners on wednesday you know a couple of things leaked out some of it right some of it wrong i'm not sure it's bad to have people speculating and it's great that people care uh, but anybody that thinks they have one in March or April or early May, uh, you can rest assured that is false because it truly is not done until the very last minute, until the commissioner says, all right, pencils down. Paul, I want to follow up on that real quick, Mike. That's actually earlier than usual too, right? Based on when you have it done, having it done three days in advance, based on the past, isn't that a little bit earlier than usual? Yeah, look, what we did this year, kind of like you guys hinted at, as soon as we said it's going to be May and this is the new normal, we actually went ahead and confirmed the date. So we gave all of our clubs date certainty. We gave all of our broadcast partners date certainty. So we knew it was May 12th, whether we were done or not. So obviously wanted to get to the commissioner, 
it wasn't May 10th was the first time he'd seen us and the first time he'd seen schedules. We'd been checkpointing with him once a week, every week for the last probably five or six weeks. So he had a real good feel for what we were doing, how we were solving the puzzle, what the primetime schedule looked like, who was going to London, who's playing on Thanksgiving, who's playing on Christmas. What changes at the end there is really kind of on the margins. It's this three-game road trip or that three-game road trip. It's this team with a road after road Monday or that team with a road after road Monday. Or this team has to play a couple teams coming off their bye weeks or that team does. And it just kind of moves around. You know, it's, it's bad luck. It just kind of moves around. If we're doing our jobs, we're not letting it fall on the same team over and over and over again or at least the same way over and over and over again. So, you know, everybody's got something in their schedule that they don't love. But hopefully it's not the same thing they didn't love in their schedule last year. (laughs) Mike, so people can appreciate exactly what you guys go through from the time the season ends. And I know there's a lot of technology involved. I remember when Val Pinchback had the medallions on the board in his office years ago. But what is the typical day like? Do you actually get any days off between the end of the season and the schedule release? Or is it really something that totally consumes you? No days off, man. It's 24-7. It's all day, every day. It it has to be. You know, first and foremost, it's an impossible mathematical exercise. So we're never going to find the one, but we're going to keep looking for it. And, you know, it would be irresponsible not to take every second of every day, make sure the computers are searching through the infinite solution space and looking for the magical, mythical one schedule. So we're all day, every day. And you referenced Val. You know, we were all day, every day when we were working with Val. But we were making the schedule one game at a time. We would hang a tag under the Giants, hang a tag under the Eagles, hang a tag under the Falcons, and you'd build a week, and then you'd build the next week, and then you'd build the next week. You had no idea where you were heading. You had no idea what corners you were painting yourselves into. You had no idea what pain you were about to inflict on somebody because of a decision you made a week ago. You know, now, the way the computers work, basically they're all bow. And every single one of those computers is a different bow. And they're all in a different branch of the search tree. And they're all trying to figure out, all right, primetime schedule, Sunday afternoon schedule, Thanksgiving, London, Christmas, three-game road trip, stadium block, Beyonce concerts, whatever it is. And we're just searching, searching, searching. And every single one of those bows, every single one of those instances, every single one of those computers could come back with a schedule every night. They're all talking to each other. They've all got the same rules. They've all got the same constraints. They've all got the same scoring system. So we wake up in the morning. We might have eight, we might have 10, we might have 40. One of them is going to be good. And at any given point in the process, there's always one best so far. Leader in the clubhouse, it's hanging on the wall. If the commissioner came downstairs, I mean, we haven't actually been in the office for him to come downstairs, but if the commissioner got on our Zoom and said, give me the best one you got, I do want to put it out tomorrow. We've always got one. It's always hanging on the wall, but there's always a flaw or multiple flaws. What's the worst thing about the leader in the clubhouse? Might be that three-game road trip for Houston, might be that CBS 1 o'clock window in week 7. Might be the sequencing of the ESPN games in week 13, 14, 15. Whatever it is, go fix it. Computers were on all night. You come in tomorrow morning. Now the Houston three-game road trip's gone. The CBS 1 o'clock window in week 7 is perfect. And the ESPN sequencing in week 13, 14, 15 couldn't be better. All right, what do we break? Now you got a three-game road trip for San Francisco. You've got a stadium block that you had to play over in Atlanta. And you've got the Seattle Seahawks finishing road, road with a road Monday night game on the East Coast in week 17. Is that schedule better? If it is, put it on the wall. New leader in the clubhouse. What's the worst thing about it? Probably that Seattle road after road Monday in week 17 and 18. Let's go fix that. If it's not better, leader survives, king of the hill, throw another contender at it. The more contenders you throw at that leader in the clubhouse and the more it survives, the better we're going to feel about it and the closer to optimal we're probably getting. So just to understand how it works then, Mike, will you guys then basically at the end of every day, go back into your computers, put in a new, like an additional rules. We're like, all right, well, don't do this. Don't do this. And then see what happens. Is that how it works pretty much? Yeah, that's exactly right. The computers run all night long. We come in in the morning. What did we find? Well, here's a good schedule. Here's a not as good schedule. Here's a really good schedule. Really good for NBC. Maybe not so good for, you know, the Kansas city chiefs, but all these schedules are absolutely playable. They're feasible, they're completed, they're legal. We could play any one of them. Which one's the best so far? Well, it's probably this one, but I don't like that three-game road trip. And that schedule over there, contender number 37, he had to die for that, you know, back-to-back cross-country trip for Miami. They didn't want that this year. There's been years that have gone west and stayed west. 
and paired them off and practiced out there. They didn't want that this year. So write some new rules. Don't do that to Miami. Fix the stadium block in Minnesota. Fix the three-game road trip for Houston. And doggone it, that week seven for CBS. We just can't get it right. Maybe we should change the rules, change the penalties, run it again. And then tomorrow, we're getting a little better. We're getting a little closer to optimal. But we've also shrunk the solution space because now there's a whole bunch of stuff we're unwilling to see. So every night we take a solution space and we shrink it, we shrink it, we shrink it. And then, of course, one day we shrunk it too far. No good schedules came out the next day. All right, what do we do? We broke it. Let's look back at all the rules we've written over the last three days, five days, three weeks, and maybe we're going to have to build that solution space back up again, change some rules, compromise some of the things we wanted. A must-have becomes a like-to-have. Uh, must not have becomes a preferred not to have. And you just kind of keep tinkering. You just kind of keep perturbing and moving the tags around like Val would do by hand, except we get to do it, you know, 3,000, 5,000, 10,000 times a night. At some point, one of these schedules is going to check most of our boxes. Mike, with the 17th game this year over the course of 18 weeks, I saw a quote from you about how it created infinite more possibilities and solutions. I guess what I'd like to know is, from a percentage perspective, how much harder was it, or did it turn out actually to be a blessing for you? Bit of both. Um, strictly mathematically, it took an infinite solution space and didn't just double or triple it, but exponentially increased it. And like I said, I'm not sure we get through the entire solution space ever. We certainly don't get through it in one night with 15 hours and 3,000 computers. So... You know, I always liken this process to finding the best grain of sand on the beach. We just turned that beach into, you know, the entire Atlantic seaboard. I mean, there is just no way we're going to be able to search through the entire solution space, certainly not in the night. Um, that being said, there were a couple of benefits to having the extra game. Um, you know, the biggest thing was you look at those extra games, those extra interconference games. This year it's NFC at AFC. Next year it'll be AFC at NFC, and it'll just keep rotating. Uh, but this year you look at some of those extra games – Green Bay, Kansas City, Dallas, New England, Seattle, Pittsburgh, Giants, Miami. You know, these extra games, there's some high-quality inventory there, and we've got a lot of mouths to feed with all of our network partners. Now the extra week worth of primetime games and doubleheader games and uh, having a few extra really good, juicy apples, knowing everybody needs a bite of the good apples, uh, that helps us out a lot. So, you know, a bit of both. It made the solution space even harder to get through, but it gave us a few more good apples to dole out to the partners. You know, Mike, I want to paint the picture here for fans out there because they might not know, but you are one of the most powerful suits at 345 Park Avenue. You're yeah, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> You're basically running the building. No, I'm just kidding. I imagine though, you have the TV networks hanging on one sleeve. You have the teams hanging on the on on your coattails. You have, you know, you have the guys that run the stadiums booking different concerts hanging on your right sleeve. How do you balance all of that together in trying to figure this out because look we all know how important the tv partners is none of us are doing what we're doing without the money coming in from them so let's not make believe they're not really important because they are and we all know how important obviously it is to maintain competitive balance so how do you kind of put all that into the bowl mix it up and, and make sure as many people are as happy as possible when you get to the end it's part art and part science um you know i hinted at some of the science here when we're searching through an infinite space. We use a negative-based scoring system, which means we penalize all the things that we don't want to have happen, whether that's something happening to a television partner or something happening to a team. And the more penalty points you have in any given schedule, in theory, the more people you're going to have that are going to be disappointed. So the lower the score, the better. And the science and the math and the servers and the AWS instances, you know, they're searching, searching, searching. They run all day, every day, and hopefully we're making some progress there. But Part of this is art as well, and that's where some of the humans come in. Uh, you guys know Howard Katz. He's been running the scheduling process for the last 15 years. Um, you know, some of the things that get decided in the schedule get decided in, in his gut, in his head. Uh, and some of it is Howard just kind of offers up some guidelines and some guardrails and some constraints, and we kind of feed that into the computer. And basically, as the guy that touches the computers the most, I'm trying to teach them to read Howard's mind. You know, when Howard says, I don't know if that's the right Sunday night football schedule. I'll know it when I see it. Uh, all right. How do you tell his computer that, you know, when Howard says something like, Oh, that sounds like a football game. All right. How do you write a mathematical model for that? You know? So we're trying to teach the computers what's in Howard's head and what's in Howard's head is the best possible television with the least possible team pain. 
And those two things really are bifurcated. You know, you could make a really good television schedule, nothing but Giants and Cowboys and Patriots and Packers and Chiefs every week, prime time, national windows. That's probably not going to be our best team schedule. There's going to be a lot of pain on the teams to accommodate that. You could make perfect team schedules. Every team, home, away, home, away, mid-season bye. Nobody plays in Florida in September when it's 110 degrees. Nobody plays in Lambeau in January when it's negative three. That's not going to be our best television schedule. So somewhere between those two extremes, we're trying to find the balance, that right shade of gray that, like you said, maybe doesn't make everybody happy, but maybe disappoints them all equally and hopefully just a little. On the flip side to that, Mike, and we all know human nature is always going to try to complain about something, but do you ever get really great compliments from either some of your network partners or some of your teams that say, boy, you really took care of us this year? Uh, Look, I'd be lying if I said the answer was no. Uh, There are definitely people that call and say thank you. Um, You know, there are definitely people that call with, let's call it constructive criticism. Um, You know, what we try to do, quite frankly, is is learn from that. You know, there are things, like I said, we write rules. There's probably at our absolute peak, let's say 26, 27,000 rules that are written that helps us get to this final product right here. And those are rules for teams, those are rules for stadium, travel, rest, but also rules for television, you know, quantity and quality in every window for CBS and Fox and primetime games and who got primetime games and who didn't get primetime games and who got them at home and who didn't get them at home. And, you know, if you took this game away from Fox and you put it on NBC, then what are you going to give back to Fox to make good? You know, it's a zero-sum game, right? You guys know this. Anything good for the Giants is bad for the Eagles. Anything good for CBS, is probably bad for Fox. So, you know, we try to balance everybody. We try to take the feedback. Uh, If somebody calls and says, this is perfect, we are so unbelievably happy, network or club, if somebody calls and they're that happy, maybe we tilted it a little too far to them. (laughs) Same token, if somebody calls and says, this is unacceptable, how could you do this? Like, what is wrong with you guys? You claim to have 3,000 computers running, you need 3,000 more. I can't believe you guys think this is the best product. You know, then we probably missed on that too. So again, trying to strike the balance. Nobody's ever all the way happy. We try to think about it as everybody gets something. Nobody gets everything. Well, Mike, I will send some good vibes your way because you're sending us to LA and Miami in December. Thank you for that. Not that's great. I'll deal with the Chicago on January 2nd. That might be a little chilly. That's okay. But we get the two warm weather sites. That's awesome. I'll tell you, it's always interesting to me when the cold weather club complain about cold weather. <laughs> right? I mean, you get a home game, it's going to be just as cool. But yeah. uh, I, I get it. And look, remember this next year when, you know, week 16 and 17, you're in cold weather places again. I mean, it just kind of moves around. It just kind of spins differently every time. And like I said, the schedule doesn't really finish until the very, very end when the commissioner said, yeah, that's the one. And the one right before that might have had you in Chicago in September and might have had you, you know, in Kansas City in week 17. You never know until you're actually finished, until the jigsaw puzzle completes. And then, like we said, everybody's probably got something to legitimately complain about, but hopefully they've got something that they say, you know what, that's going to work out pretty well. And also, thank you, by the way. No travel on the holidays, Thanksgiving or Christmas. That's always great. Love to love to do that. We can drive to Philly day of on the 26th. We're a big, big fan of that, Mike. Thank you for that. Um, Again, remember that next year because I will. Dallas is back on Fox on Thanksgiving and somebody's got to go. <laughs> I got you. I got you. Um, without assigning the request to the actual team, so we keep it kind of anonymous, what are the most common requests that you usually get from teams? Is it consecutive road games? Is it not facing other teams off other teams by weeks? Is what are the most common things from a competitive balance perspective that you get from teams in terms of requests? So, you know, they feel as good about their schedule as possible simply from a football perspective. Yeah, look, the truth is everybody, you know, all 32 teams submit a request a document in January, you know, here's what you need to know, guys. Our stadium is and isn't available on these weeks. And now that we know our opponents, we do or do not want to pair up our cross-country trips. Um, You know, yeah, of course, we'd love to avoid going to Florida in September when it's 110. And, of course, we'd 
love to avoid going to Chicago on January 2nd. Um, you know, those requests, they're, they're kind of evergreen. You know, everybody wants the same thing. Everybody wants to open at home. Everybody wants to close at home. And everybody wants a week 10 buy. I'm not sure we can <laughs> do that for all 32 teams. So, you know, some of those requests are, you know, they go in the pile of the unlikely to be accommodated. But, um, you know, if there was something in there very specific to a club, like you said, you know, here's a team that caught a three-game road trip last year. And their coach or then their general manager might think that a three-game road trip is the absolute worst thing you can do to us. And, you know, when Ernie, of course, the year old guy, helped us out a few years ago, you know, we were trying to pick his brain. Like, what do you look for in the schedule? And he told me something. He told us something that, you know, I've never forgotten. It's who you play, not where. So if you've got a three-game road trip and you want to complain about it, but those three road games are close trips and maybe playing three teams that combined had, you know, eight wins last year, we could break up that three-game road trip and give you a home game against Kansas City instead. Is that better? You know, I I don't know. So, you know, everybody's got their own preferences. They all get a chance to submit those preferences, the teams and the network. We take all that feedback. We solicit it. We meet with them. We have phone calls, emails, texts. But then by about mid-February, we kind of close and lock the door, and that's it. And the next time you hear from us is on release day. And, look, every team says we don't want a three-game road trip. Totally get that. Mathematically, we haven't yet played a schedule with zero three-game road trips, so it's going to happen to somebody. But, again, hopefully it moves around. If you caught a three-game road trip last year, you shouldn't catch one again this year, and probably not next year either. And if you caught a road after road Monday, I think if I'm right, you guys actually caught two road after road Mondays not that long ago. You know, we tell the computer the following year, man, we are not doing that to the Giants again. We'll do something else they'll hate, but we will not do that to the Giants again. And after about three or four or five years, maybe the penalty for a road after road Monday for the Giants starts to inch back down again because in the interim four or five years, a whole bunch of other teams have now had a road after road Monday. So it's bad luck. It moves around, but hopefully it lands on people that it hasn't landed on the same way recently. If I understood you correctly, Mike, you said the home opener, the season finale home game and the middle bye week were the three most favorite things that people would like to get from you. Is the three consecutive road games, the biggest thorn that people do complain about, or is there something else that is equally p- problematic for them? You know, the, the three-game road trips happen, and there have been three-game road trips in this league that have been onerous, and there have been three-game road trips in this league that, you know, don't knock a team off their stride at all. I'll remember, um, this has got to be 10 years ago now, because Jeff Garcia was playing quarterback for the Eagles. They had a three-game road trip in December – against all the division opponents. And we knew that was tough. And when we put the schedule out, we called uh, the Eagles ahead of time and we warned them. And to their credit, they didn't complain. Uh, their, you know, local media was all over us, but the Eagles said, hey, look, they'll tell us when to play. We'll show up. We knew we were playing those three division opponents. You know, whether we play them in December or spread out throughout the season, you know, they tell us when to show up, we show up. They won all three of those games. And Garcia took them to the playoffs. And it was hard then for us to think that we had ruined their season. That being said, we wrote a rule the next year. Let's not give anybody a three-game road trip against all three division opponents. So we learn something every year. Some of it is ugly and bad, and we feel horrible about it. And we're not allowed to root for anybody, of course. But if we gave somebody a really tough stretch in their schedule, we might be rooting for them, at least over that stretch, just to feel like, you know, we didn't ruin their season. The truth of the matter is you guys have been doing this long enough. Uh, The good teams win and overcome challenges and the bad teams, you know, find reasons to struggle. Uh, I hope it's not a result of the schedule, um, but, you know, nobody is writing in and asking for a three-game road trip, right? Nobody is asking for a road after road Monday. And I'll tell you one thing we're getting a little bit more surgical on is maybe even after a home Monday, you know, we think to ourselves a road Monday – followed by a road game, oh, that's tough to do to a club. Sometimes a home Monday followed by a road game could be just as bad, depending on how far you're going and are you going to travel on Friday. And, yeah, all right, maybe it's not a road Monday, but it's still a Monday. Yeah, you're at home, but you're still not done with everything until 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock in the morning. And now you're on an airplane again on Friday. So we can't guarantee that every single team that plays on Monday, home or away, is home the following weekend. But 
I think one of the things that we're starting to pay a little bit more attention to is, you know, some of these long trips, if you're going to go on a Friday, we should pay a little more attention to where are you the week before. And if you are at home, maybe not on Monday, stuff like that. We learn a little bit every year. Uh, everybody's, like I said, not real shy with their constructive criticism. One thing I've heard, Mike, that you can't tell just by looking at an individual individual team schedule that I know some teams have expressed you know, concerns over before is the amount of times the team has to play an opponent that's either coming off of a bye or a Thursday game. So they have more rest days leading up to a particular matchup than your team does. That's a tough thing to track. I think at least from our perspective, is that something that you guys do make a conscious effort to try to keep relatively even across the teams? Uh, even is tough, right? Uh, we're of never course. going to make a schedule where every single team is, you know, either plus four or minus four and, you know, no edge cases. Um, what we try to do is eliminate the real egregious outlier. So I'll, I'll give you an example. You know, this schedule fits out in our software and these are all the home and road games. And, you know, there's a second page to this document that comes right behind it. And it's literally every single team's rest. You're playing somebody coming off a of Monday night, you're plus one. You're coming off your bye, you're plus seven. They're coming off their bye, you're minus seven. And we total everybody up for the whole season. Now, you could have a minus 12 or a minus 13 and not play anybody coming off their bye. You're playing them off a couple of Thursdays. You're playing off a Saturday or two. You could also play a couple of teams coming off their bye, but then somebody's playing you coming off your bye, and you get another Thursday back and a Saturday, and next thing you know, you're at zero. So – we're never going to balance it all the way, but we try to eliminate the edge case. If this document spits out and it says under New York Giants minus 32, <laughs> that schedule's got to go in the garbage. <laughs> if it says minus 15, well, that's probably on the edge of where we're willing to go. But let's look back over the last couple of years. Like we said, we shouldn't hit the Giants with a road, a three-game road trip. If we hit them with a three-game road trip last year, we probably shouldn't hit them with a minus 15 if we hit them with a minus 15 last year. That being said, and I'm sure your analytics guys are all over this, I'm not sure rest disparity actually impacts win percentage. Yeah, Mike, know? that was even my question because I don't think it does based on the it numbers. Does. That's why I wondered how much you actually track that or not. Look, it's, it's anecdotal maybe, and no team should ever feel like, holy cow, we got the worst schedule in the league, although obviously somebody has to. Um, but again, if there's a minus 30-something, that's probably not our best schedule. If everybody's kind of somewhere between – you know, minus 10 and plus 10, that might be about the best we can do. And when we have 3,000 computers searching through the infinite, infinite space every night, if we can kick out dozens and dozens of schedules every night, we can throw away the ones that have an edge case where somebody we know is going to be disappointed. If we painted ourselves into a corner with the primetime schedule and London and Mexico and Beyonce, then we might only see three schedules in a night. And to throw one of them away just because somebody was minus 17 total, we might not have that luxury. So we do try to track with our analytics folks. We talk to Elias all the time. You know, it used to be, it felt like it used to be, you play a road game against a team coming off their bye. That's about the worst thing you could do to somebody. They're home. They're rested. You've got to get on an airplane and fly to them. And I've been doing this now 20-something years. About 10 years ago, we had maybe a 10-year stretch where the win percentage for the road team playing a team coming off their bye was something like 38%. And that's down about 20% from the 45% or so that a normal road win percentage is. And so we always said, oh, that's the worst thing you can do to somebody. We've been tracking it over the last few years. It's flipped. Believe it or not, it's actually gone the other way now. You're the road team, and you're playing a guy coming off their bye. You win at a better clip than if you guys were at zero rest. It's just random. It's wow. just anecdotal. If there's something that somebody really says that is truly unfair, we will obviously try to avoid it. I'm not sure rest disparity falls in that category yet. Mike, I don't want to go through all the different millions of conditions and, and rules that you put into the Good. group, but there is one <laughs> that I do want to ask you about because every once in a while we see it where – common opponents let's say the giants and dallas might play each other twice within a three week or four week span it does not happen very often and i wonder if that's something that you guys make a concerted effort not to have yeah i mean look it two at two two sides to that coin um 
you know, we've got six division games. We try to spread them out throughout the season. Now that we're on 18 weeks, you know, it's a little harder to spread them out. Uh, but on the other side of that coin, we love division games late. And we tell the computer, hey, look, if the Cowboys and the Giants are going to play each other only two weeks apart, it should be a penalty. We'd love to spread them out. But it should be a bigger penalty if it happens in week six and eight than if it happens in week 15 and 17. We love division games late. It keeps the playoff races tight. It keeps everybody in it. You know, a bit of an anomaly in the NFC East this year. There's a lot of division games in the NFC East late in the year. I think the Red, uh, Washington might finish with five in a row. Um, it, it, it's not exactly what we set out to accomplish, uh, but it's going to keep the NFC East interesting right to the end. So uh, do we want them that close? We don't. Do we want division series ending too early? We don't. Uh, do we love division games late in the season? We do. Um, you know, ideally they're spread out maybe a little better than they are in the NFC East this year. But when we get to December and we have this conversation again, honestly, I'm hoping you're all seven and seven uh, and every game matters. And the NFC East comes right down to the wire with some crazy playoff tiebreaker scenarios. That That's, that's best case for me. Yeah, I'll, I'll be good with that. Um, two primetime questions, Mike. What are the rules now th- in terms of does each team have to be on Thursday ones? Is it overall primetime ones? Are there any set rules with how many, what teams or how many times each team has to be in primetime, where they are in primetime? Because I know at one point there was. What's the rule with that now? Look, the truth is everybody gets a national game because we play Thursday games almost every week of the season. And as you guys know, we don't allow teams currently to have more than one short week Thursday. So if we're going to play Thursday games, that many games, you include Thanksgiving, you start in week two, you go all the way through to week 16, maybe week 17 some years. You know, if you're going to play that many short weeks, everybody's going to play one. So you know everybody's going to be at least on the Thursday night football schedule. As you guys have heard, that Thursday night football schedule shifts next year to Amazon. Um, right now, it's kind of split between NFL Network and Fox. But next year, it's going to be all Amazon, and they're going to have 14 or 15 Thursday games. And that means everybody's going to play one. So you don't need a rule. You're kind of stuck with it. Everybody's going to be on national television somewhere. You can also point to, you know, a 9.30 a.m. London. You can point to Thanksgiving. Is there a rule that everybody has to be on Monday night football or Sunday night football? No. Um, but everybody's going to be on national television. And, look, that's what flexible scheduling is for. You know, there are definitely teams that on release day were a little surprised and maybe a little disappointed they weren't, you know, represented more on the primetime schedule. But, you know, you get out the gate strong. You're in a playoff chase in December. The Sunday night football game we thought in May looked great. Now suddenly doesn't have playoff implications. You can play your way on the primetime schedule. And once we get to 2023 and the new television deals kick in, we've got flexible scheduling for Monday night football as well. So yeah, there's going to be a lot that, of opportunity. <laughs> well, it's going to be interesting, but I'll tell you this, and it's the same thing with the Sunday night. Nobody's going to be surprised, right? We're going to know six weeks out, four weeks out, and we're going to call you and tell you, hey, look, you see it, we see it. The Sunday night game, the Monday night game in week 15 that we saw back in May looked great. Maybe it isn't going to be by the time we get there and, you see your record and you see who you're playing that week. And, you know, you want to tweet it out to your fans or you want us to actually tell them, we'll tell them you are a candidate six weeks from now for a move into a bigger, higher profile television slot. Is that a challenge for the 50,000 ticket holders? Yes. Is there a benefit to the 25 million people that are going to watch on television? Of course. So, you know, what does Fox say? Sometimes the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. That's what's going to end up happening. We're going to make sure that we've got, if we can, really good television games and all the windows. And that's an opportunity for a club that maybe felt a little underrepresented, a little underserved by the primetime schedule in May, has an opportunity to play their way into those windows. You know, Mike, you led me perfectly into my follow-up primetime question. Because for the second straight year, the Giants don't have a Sunday night football game scheduled before the season started. Now. I don't blame you guys. The Giants in December, the last five or six years, they haven't exactly been in the playoff mix, so I get it. But Paul and I were just talking about this on our show the other day. You look at that December schedule. hmm, There's some big markets there. Chicago, L.A., Miami, Dallas, 
Philly. So I've been kind of warning giant fans that you might want to hold your powder a little bit. If you're, if you're booking flights and stuff, because if the giants are in it with some of those matchups, there's probably a pretty decent chance. You might find them on Sunday night football sometime in December. Yeah. Look, we talked a little earlier about part art and part science, you know, are the New York Giants a slam dunk must appear on the Sunday night football schedule in 2021? Obviously not. Otherwise you'd be on it. Are they a slam dunk under no circumstances? Can we consider a Giants game for Sunday night football this year? No, definitely not. We considered it. So now you talk about, you know, that's the art side. What do we think the Giants are and look at their opponents and what do we want to do with all those games? Now the science side, the math side, the Giants go into the software on the NBC Sunday night schedule as a minimum zero, maximum one, let's say. So the computer could spit out today and put Giants Cowboys, Giants Chiefs, Giants Bucks on Sunday night, but then those games aren't available for Monday night or for the Fox doubleheader. You know, I know Sunday night's the premier package, but, you know, you're in the Fox doubleheader window, you're on ESPN a couple times, you're on Thursday night football early in the season on NFL Network. Um, You know, there's still a lot of national television Part art, part science. What are the Giants worth to us? What are we willing to see? What are we unwilling to see? And then science, here's your minimum, here's your maximum, here's your pool of eligible games, go. And when the computers come back and they say, I've got a schedule with Giants Cowboys on Sunday Night Football, and computer number 475 says, well, I've got a schedule with that Giants Cowboys game on Fox. And then computer number 3,712 says, I've got a schedule with Giants Cowboys and giant chiefs on Monday night football. How do you compare all those schedules top to bottom, right to left, as though you're the president of each of these television networks, as though you're the coach or general manager of each of these teams, and you're just trying to strike the right balance. You know, was the schedule with the giants Cowboys game on Sunday night football playable? Absolutely. Yes. Was it better than the one we're playing now where the giants weren't on Sunday night football, but they're on ESPN twice. Obviously not. Or we'd be playing that one. So this was the one we chose. Is it perfect? Of course not. Does every team have a legitimate gripe? They do. Um, but, you know, the Giants not being on Sunday Night Football, to your point, may not be the way we finish this season. A final one from me, Mike. Do the networks still have the protection rules in place where they can still protect some? And what is the maximum? It seemed to me that at some point there was a maximum number of primetime games a team could have. And then all of a sudden, I, I think a year or two ago, it seemed like there were exceptions where somebody could get like a six game instead of just having five. Yeah, that, that, that's always been the rule. You can be scheduled for five. You can get flexed into a six. And then when you get to the final weekend of the season, especially now, because this final weekend of the season doesn't just need a Sunday night game at the end, but it also needs two Saturday games. Think about your game last year in week 17 against Dallas. You both took the field knowing it was lose and go home win and get a little help that's a perfect saturday game for the final weekend of the season now because when it was on sunday afternoon there's eight nine ten twelve other games going on you know it was basically a playoff game so that's a real good candidate for like saturday night of the final weekend of the season two teams fighting for their lives but not clinching any spots and rendering a whole bunch of games on sunday you know now meaningless so we're looking for those stay alive games those play-in games So now, yeah, the final weekend of the season is going to have a few more national windows. You can be scheduled for five. You can be flexed into a six. And then the final weekend of the season, anything goes. We're going to find the right games for the right windows and sequence the final weekend of the season so that hopefully you kind of start with the win and hope, and then you get to the win and watch, and then you get to, okay, these guys are fighting for their lives, and then you get to the final game of the season, which is hopefully a playoff game, win and in, lose and go home. That's, that's what we're looking for for the final week. And then how about the protections, Mike? Can these networks still protect? Right, sorry, yeah, definitely. Look, CBS and Fox obviously uh, aren't volunteering to give away their best games to prime time. They, you know, want good ratings for all NFL windows. But, you know, like we said, it's a zero-sum game. If you take away CBS's best game and you put it on NBC, CBS isn't going to be thrilled with that. So three weeks out on a rolling basis, 18 days out, CBS and Fox are each going to be able to protect the game from either being cross flex or being moved into a primetime window, just Sunday nights for this year and next 2023, the Monday night flex kicks in. And again, I think we're going to be really candid with everybody. We're going to be really honest. I will email or call Mr. Marin. I'll tell him this game is protected. You don't have to worry about that one getting moved. 
but that game right there is not. And you see who you're playing, and you see the Monday night game that week, and you see it might be in trouble. You should start thinking about, and you may start wanting to warning your fans that game's a candidate to get moved into a higher profile time slot. I know it's not ideal for the ticket holder, but it's a win for the fan at home. It's a win for the television viewer, and I, and I think that's what we're going to try to do. We're going to try to be real honest, a little aim high, steering, let everybody know what's coming down the pike. And again, I don't think we're surprising anybody. Anybody who gets flexed out of Sunday night football isn't being told anything they don't know, right? Our season isn't as good as we'd hope. I wish we were better. But since we're not, you know, there's no reason for us to play in prime time. There's no reason to subject our fans to that. Why don't we let Tennessee or Miami or Carolina, teams that maybe the schedule makers didn't see in their crystal ball back in May, but have now played their way into the prime time slot, put them in the national window. And Mike, just to help Giant fans out, and tell me if I'm right or wrong. If you're looking at the schedule in, in December and you see a 425 game, probably better chance a 425 game is protected than a game scheduled at one. Is that correct? Yeah, you got it. I mean, that being said, look at week number 15, right? We've got a Seattle Rams game at 425, and maybe Fox protects it, maybe they don't. But we've also got Dallas Giants and Green Bay Baltimore in the 1 o'clock window that day. If I had to guess right now, I would say probably either Dallas Giants or Green Bay Baltimore moves to 425 mm. to join the Western game, the, the NFC West game. And, you know, yeah, generally speaking, when we put a game at 425 and everybody can point to it, you know, Green Bay, Kansas City, Dallas, New England, Pittsburgh, Kansas City, the obvious, if you will, 425 national doubleheader game that's likely to be protected by CBS and Fox. That's why we put it there. Uh, but the one o'clock games where we've got three, four, five, six, seven, eight games going on all at the same time, you know, if there's a really good one in there, only making it available to 18 or 20% of the country feels like that's not the right thing for the fan. If there's a really big game at one o'clock that more people need to see, that game's a real good candidate to move to 425 or to age 15. Final question, Mike, how did the pandemic impact this? Getting this schedule together for one, um, and even, you know, planning next year's schedule and planning last year's schedule. And I guess you didn't really know about it at that point, but how did the pandemic affect everything you guys did getting all this together the last couple of years? Yeah. I mean, the first thing it did obviously is it impacted the team, right? We're not in the office. We're not in the Val Pinchbeck room. We're not sitting there with the pegboard. You know, we were on zooms every day, sometimes for four or five, six hours on, Zoom, Wow, which everybody is right. That's what we're all doing these days. Um, but you know, other than the human toll, um, the truth is, you know, this whole process is automated. Like we said, there's 2,500 computers. They're scattered throughout the planet. Some are in Europe. Some are in Asia. Heaven knows where they are. All I know is, you know, they're four hours ahead of us or four hours behind us. <laughs> um, you know, they never stop running. So as long as I can get to them, it doesn't matter whether I'm at 345 Park or in Westchester County, New York, or I don't want to say on a golf course, but somewhere else, uh, able to access the computers to make sure they're still working. Um, you know, we spent a lot of time last year. You know, we were building the schedule last year during the early stages of the pandemic. And you guys know, you know, the schedule kind of had some levers in it, kind of had some trap doors, kind of had a few things in there where just in case we were going to have, you know, a, a little wiggle room. Um, if you've looked at this year's schedule, you'll see that's not the case. We're not anticipating being unable to start on time. There's no weeks in there where nobody's got a division game. There's no weeks in there where, you know, these two weeks have one home and one road for every team in the league. And therefore, if we had to put two in the garbage, those are the first two to go. There's nothing like that in this year's schedule. Um, you know, if there was any sort of reaction to the pandemic, you know, maybe walk before we run again with the international games, uh, you know, instead of four games in London, one in Mexico, you know, we're talking about Germany. We're talking about, you know, all kinds of other options this year, just to, just two in Mexico. I'm sorry, two in London. Um, let's make sure we can get those in, get everybody, you know, comfortable traveling again, traveling internationally. Um, so, you know, that, that was probably the biggest give, if you will, as far as the pandemic goes. Uh, that, and I'll give you one more, because you guys were part of this too. Uh, teams pairing up cross-country trips. Last year's mm. schedule had, I think, eight teams pairing up long trips, planning to go and stay and find a practice facility and, and not kind of ping pong back and forth across the country. Uh, we didn't get nearly as many as requests this year from the clubs 
to go and stay. So that may have had something to do with, with the pandemic. You know, it might also have more to do with, you know, just the rotation of the games. Maybe there were just fewer teams playing, you know, that many cross-country trips. Certainly the Eastern guys going West. Uh, the Western guys still have, obviously, as usual, plenty of games coming East. Uh, really only San Francisco was, was adamant that they wanted to make sure they paired a couple of them up. Uh, a few other teams were, you know, open-minded to it, but not the must-have like it was last year. So maybe some clubs made some, you know, concessions to COVID. Uh, like I said, we did a little bit with the international games, but uh, otherwise this schedule, like last year's schedule, is intended to start on September 9th and be played in order all the way through and finish up on January 9th. I know I said final question, but I have to ask this question for Paul. I can't believe he didn't ask it because he loves international travel so much. Mike, what's the future here for NFL international with teams, you know, just going forward, what should fans expect? What should these teams expect in terms of how much they're going to be going overseas? How many a year, where just everything you guys are kind of workshopping right now on park Avenue. Yeah, here's what we're doing. It's one of the benefits of the expanded season. Uh, we've got, as you know, one conference with an extra home game every year, and we're going to rotate it. Not until infinity, because otherwise what's going to happen is, you know, the same teams, if they keep finishing in the same spots in their standing, are going to visit those same teams every four years. We don't want that. So at some point, we're probably going to reset the rotation. But essentially, we're going to alternate NFC, AFC, NFC, AFC. Whichever conference has the extra home game, four teams from that conference are going to be part of the international package. It just seems fair. It just makes sense. Like I said, the predominant, you know, overwhelming majority games are going to be in the UK. Uh, We've built quite a fan base over there. And they've gotten a lot smarter. I know you guys have been over there. They're wearing jerseys of current players now instead of just retired players. Uh, they're not <laughs> cheering quite loudly for punts and kickoffs. Uh, they understand the game a lot better. And, uh, you know, the London games are a spectacle. They are really, really fun. Uh, we're going to play, you know, three or four of those every year. We're kicking around Germany a little bit. I'm sure we'll be back in Mexico next year. Uh, but the expectation is that the conference with the extra home game is going to kick in to help source the international game. And now you can just get on a rotation. Four teams out of the AFC this year, four teams out of the NFC next year, four teams out of the AFC this year, and you rotate it around. And basically once every eight years, you're going to give up a home game to the international folks. All right. Sounds awesome, Mike. Great stuff, man. We really appreciate it. This was fantastic. You're very generous with your time. Uh, Anything else you want to get out there or tell the folks before we say goodbye? Uh, Look, I'll, I'll only say that, you know, everybody's got something to complain about and that's fair. Um, But I hope, you know, the more we talk about it like this, the more people realize, you know, the conspiracy theorists and, oh, the league office hates this team or that player just couldn't be further from the truth. It really couldn't. There's no such thing. Um, It's it's a a labor of love, but it's also one where we know that it's a zero sum game. So, uh, we're really happy with where we landed. Yeah, there's going to be some legitimate gripes. If they really pan out to be, you know, impactful, we'll learn from them and, and, and hopefully never do a team that same way again. Um, you know, most of the teams are pretty satisfied with their schedule. Most of the television networks are pretty satisfied with their schedule. I hope it all plays out right. I hope it all goes according to plan. And I hope we're having this conversation again in December where, like I said, everybody's 7-7 seven and seven and everything's still to play for. Um, that, that would be a good schedule. Well, and I hope Mike, you can get some rest the next couple of months because you've earned it. We really appreciate it, man. Stay safe out there. All right, bud. Always a pleasure. Thanks for having me on guys. And we hope that we hope to see you at a stadium or two this year, which will be great for everybody involved. That would be great. It would be be much better than seeing me in my car at soccer practice. I would love to see out of my life this year. Yes, absolutely. Everybody. Thanks for being with us on this episode of the Giants little podcast for Michael North and Paul Dottino. I'm John Schmelk. We'll see you next time, everybody. 